Good evening, everybody. Um, I, I trust you can hear me okay. Um, uh, I'm Mark Schmidt. I'm the executive director for the uh, Falmouth Museums on the Green. Uh, I want to thank you for joining me tonight for our very first virtual uh, virtual talk. Um, this is all part of our new uh, virtual talk program. As, as we know, there's a, there's a whole new world out there. And um, so we want to be able to provide more education, more entertaining programming while we continue to be safer at home. Uh, we will have more than a dozen virtual talks planned over the next few weeks. Uh, and you'll have the opportunity to meet a fascinating group of historians and authors from around the corner and around the country. Uh, the upcoming schedule and registration details are going to be posted on our website. So if you go on to museumsonthegreen.org, you will find out what's coming up. We'll also be featuring the talks in our weekly e-blast. So if you haven't signed up to receive our newsletters, please visit museumsonthegreen.org and do so. All talks will be free through July. Simply need to register in advance. If you have any questions, please email info at museumsonthegreen.org. Um, will things go perfectly? Mm, probably not, but, uh, but we'll, we'll get better as time goes along, so, so bear with me. Uh, we'd like to thank our sponsors, Cape Cod 5, First Citizens Federal Credit Union, and Martha's Vineyard Savings for making these talks possible. We also want to thank a Cousins Bookseller in Falmouth, as they will have copies of all the books involved in our series. Uh, please note, our programs will be recorded. If you have a question, at the bottom uh, of your screen, please use the chat feature to submit it. We'll answer as questions as time permits. And again, this will be kind of a, um, uh, a learning process for all of us. Uh, thank you for your support. If you are not currently a member of the Museums on the Green, we, enjoy it. we encourage you to join by visiting our website, again, museumsonthegreen.org. Now sit back and enjoy tonight's program, uh, which cleverly is brought to you by me. Now, as many of you know, uh, I used to work at the Museum of World War II up in Natick, Massachusetts. It was the, um, um, it was the largest, um, uh, it was the largest collective uh, or, or um, individual collection of, um, of artifacts ever found. And um, it, is, it is no longer there. Um, so, um, um, trying, trying to get this, uh, my, my PowerPoint to, to, to go here. Um, can everybody see that? Okay. Okay. Um, um, it, and um, I worked there for before I came to Falmouth. And one of the things I always found fascinating about World War II is how much interest it has for people even today. You may not realize this, but literally since um, uh, 1971, there has been at least one book, if not two, on the New York Times bestseller list about World War II. It continues to fascinate. For me, I happen to find the uh, the espionage the most interesting. Um, and this is, a, this is a story that I just found compelling in every way, shape, and form. And uh, I, I really hope you, you enjoy this one as much as I do. Um, wars are won by men storming up the beach. They are won by planners correctly calculating how many rations and supplies an invading force will need. They are won by tacticians laying out grand strategy, by generals inspiring the men they command, by politicians galvanizing the will to fight, by writers putting the war into words. They are won by acts of strength, bravery, and guile. But they also won by feats of imagination. 
This act of imagination helped to topple Mussolini in Italy, helped to win battles in Russia, fixated Hitler's fascination in the Balkans, and allowed the Allies to invade Sicily with much less bloodshed than might otherwise have been spilled. Operation Mincemeat has been called the most spectacular single episode in the history of deception. And the official history of World War II describes it as perhaps the most single death, the singles, the, perhaps the most successful single deception, I'll get it out, of the entire war. It was also probably the luckiest. I want to take you back to 1942. At the end, at the end of 1942, uh, the war has started to turn for the Allies. Um, they have defeated the Nazis in North Africa. Uh, they are interested in trying to create a second front. Remember, at this point, the Allies are, um, are also fighting in Russia. The, the Germans had attacked them in 1941. Um, so, now that the Allies have controlled North Africa, the obvious place to attack would be Italy. And if you look at your map right here, you can see that almost the, the most obvious place of all would be to launch from Tunisia into Sicily. It is clearly the objective that the uh, Allies would, would attempt to, to take. And if you can see that, and if I can see that, then you have to know that the Nazis could see that too. And they prepared for it. They heavily fortified Sicily, preparing for, the, for an invasion that they knew would come. If you've seen the movie, The Imitation Game, you know that the, the Allies had uh, broken um, the code of the Enigma machine. They knew what the, the Germans were thinking. So what they had to do was to realize that yes, they did want to attack Sicily. But how do we get the Germans off the scent? How can we make this a plan that we can effectively do? How can we get into Sicily without the Germans knowing? They looked at the, what, what Churchill referred to as the soft underbelly of Europe, and they realized that perhaps Sardinia was, the, was probably the place that they wanted to attack rather than Sicily, or at least that's what Hitler wanted, was thinking, that the Allies were going to go to Sardinia, not Sicily. Sicily was too obvious. Because the Germans thought this way, because Hitler thought this way, the Allies began to plan to make sure that the Allies, that the, that the Germans understood that the plans were going to come to Sardinia. They weren't, but that's what the, the Allies wanted the Germans to think. Hitler thought this way, keep them thinking this way. I introduce to you MI5. If you're familiar with espionage, you've heard of MI6, that's the, uh, the foreign service. And when you watch every James Bond movie, yeah, that's a, he's in MI6. MI5 is the domestic counterintelligence and security. They protect the home front. MI5 is also the people that comes up with all the espionage plans. They're, they're a bunch of nerds, but they come up with some, some really impressive things. And I want to introduce you to the stars of our show. Now, you're going, to, you're going to meet some interesting personalities throughout all of this. And some of them have some very classic English names. Um, to your left is a gentleman named Ewan Montague. Um, he was uh, the son of a Jewish lawyer. He had, been, he had studied at Cambridge and Harvard. Uh, his wife was from the United States and, during, and um, uh, during the war, he made sure that she went back to Maryland where her parents were from. So she's living in the United States, he's in England. Um, because he is of Jewish background, it's important to him that the Nazis be defeated. As a barrister, he used to take his bicycle to work. He'd have big files um, going. On. But he was kind of the quintessential uh, uh, British lawyer. To the right is a gentleman named Charles Chumley. Um, Chumley was six foot three. He was gawky. He wanted to join the Air Force, but he was too tall. His feet were too big. He was too gangly. But he was also 
very much, um, oh, a dreamer seeking adventure. Um, these two are the brains behind what will become known as Operation Mincemeat. Montague, Chumley, and some other gentlemen, including a guy named Ian Fleming, who you will, you've heard of before, and we're going to introduce him throughout this, this thing, made up a, a branch of MI5, which was called the 20 Com Committee. Um, they named themselves because they used the Roman numerals XX for 20. And why did they use XX? Because it means double cross. They were known as agents Mustache and Pipe. Um, Montague is interesting because in addition to um, being in naval intelligence, he was aristocratic, he was uh, uh, detail-oriented. Um, unbeknownst to him, he also had a brother uh, who was a covert Russian spy. Another member of, of the 20 committee was a gentleman named Ian Fleming. Um, yes, you know him as the author and the, and the uh, inventor of James Bond, but this is where he gets his inspiration. And as Ian Fleming, who will also be working with uh, Montague and Chumley to create this whole, whole ruse. Fleming comes into work one day, it's, it's January 1943. He had been reading a 1930s British mystery novelist named Basil Thompson. Thompson had um, achieved some success in the 1930s. It was reasonably well, well read, but not overly popular. But Fleming found it fascinating. And a book that, that uh, Fleming was reading uh, that Thompson had written in 1934 talked about how a dead body was found with some, uh, with some papers on him that turned out to be false. Thompson, um, sorry, Fleming comes into work one day and said, do you think we could pull off something like this, basically using some kind of a Trojan horse? Um, immediately, Chumley and, and Montague, who were dreamers, said, this sounds kind of cool. So they went to the kind of, uh, aptly named Sir Bernard Spilsbury, the leading pathologist of his time, and a um, uh, rather regal uh, manner thing, rather humorless. Um, but they went to Spilsbury and said, would it be possible uh, to use a dead body, a corpse, for some kind of an espionage plan? And Spilsbury thought about it and said, actually, it was possible. Now, you would have to find a body that um, would make it look like it died of natural causes. And, and they explained that um, what they wanted to do was uh, uh, make sure that they, it, it made it look as if the, uh, somebody had died in a plane crash. And Spillsbury thought about it. And they said, well, you know, actually, that's a, that's a good, good plan. If somebody dies from a plane crash, Usually they die from shock more than they die from actual drowning if it's over water. So, okay. Um, so the lungs don't necessarily have to fill up with water. This is possible. One of the things that, a word that I'm gonna use a lot throughout all of this is plausible. All, everything that they had to do had to be plausible. And Spillsbury thought about it and said, okay, well, let's think about this. So we find a corpse, we make it look like he fell from the sky over water. Hmm, that's okay, we could try that. Now, interestingly, um, he goes to his friend Bentley Purchase, the London coroner, who is um, a rather lively sort, in kind of a macabre way for a, for a coroner. He, he was a, very much a practical joker as opposed to um, uh, Spillsbury, who was very uh, buttoned up. And he explained that 
MI5 is looking for a corpse that they want to um, that they want to use this uh, for uh, for an espionage, and um, Bentley Perch said, "Okay." But now think about this. We're trying to be plausible. It is wartime. You're trying to find someone who's in their late 20s, early 30s, who's male. Well, it's wartime. You figure there's going to be a lot of corpses, but not really. All the men that are of that age are in the military. They're fighting overseas. If they're perishing, it's usually through combat. That's not going to work. You have to find someone who's still domestic, but has to die of natural causes. Well, Purchase looks around and he looks around and he looks around. And in early February, he comes across a body that he thinks will work, and he gets a hold of Montague and Chumley. The corpse um, had died from asphyxiation, and they bring it back to London, where uh, Bentley Purchase says, "I can if I put this on ice, we have it at 37 degrees Fahrenheit, I can keep it from decomposing for up to three months. So now the clock is ticking. They have a corpse as of the beginning of February. So now Montague and Chumley realize that they really, that they have to create an identity, a cover story, and everything that's going to make it work for this corpse because they've only got three months before it decomposes. They go through the newspapers, the local, um, uh, the local papers, and they realize that as they go through the obituaries, the last name Martin seems to be rather common. So they created an identity, a legend, and they name him Major William Martin, and they put him in the Royal Navy. And the reason for that was it's a common enough name. It's not exotic in any way, shape, or form. If he's in the Royal Navy, um, there's a lot of officers there. And if he's a major, he's an officer, but not so high up that the Nazis would know of him. He's not a general. He's not an admiral. So he's an officer, but not so far up, but high enough up that he could be entrusted um, uh, with, with higher ranking officers' materials. Now we have to start creating a backstory for him. He's in, the, he's in the service. We have to give him a naval ID card. Well, you can't really take a picture of a corpse. That's not going to look good. Uh, Montague notices that there is somebody in the offices of MI5 who has a reasonable passing for the corpse. He tells him that we really need to take your picture. His name's Robbie Bross. They take his picture and they put it on a naval ID card. It's, they also realize, because it looks so new, that they're going to have to issue a quote unquote replacement card. Montague starts walking around with this ID card, rubs it against his pants um, three, uh, several times a day for, for the better part of two months. Now we also have to find him a uniform. He's an officer. So they find him a uniform that would fit the corpse. It's standard issue. Chumley starts wearing it every day to work. Um, so it gives it the worn out feel. But they, And they also start looking for other things. Now, what do you think might have been the hardest thing to find for an officer at this time? Well, I'll tell you. It was underwear. Because officers get cotton underwear. And if you think anyone was going to willingly give up their cotton underwear in London to, to MI5, uh, not so fast. They ultimately find uh, somebody who's a uh, lower-ranking member of the aristocracy who's 
he got some extra pairs of, of uh, cotton underwear that he gives up to, to Chumley and Montague when he hears the story. He goes, I don't want to know what you're doing with these. Uh, I told you he's, he's got a, 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 a uniform. Again, make it plausible. So this is what Chumley is wearing uh, every day to work to give it a kind of a worn out feel. They also, what MI5 also has is something what they call pocket litter. Uh, something that would basically um, be on your person uh, when you're walking around. For a woman to be her purse, for a, a man to be a, a, things that are in his pocket, in his coat pocket, things that somebody would have on them, their personal effects. So they make sure that he had, he's got cigarettes, a watch, a, a billfold, keys. Um, actually, if you ever go to the um, Imperial War Museum in London, you can find a lot of this stuff. They have to give William Martin a backstory, things that you would find on him. Because, again, you have to make sure that this is plausible. Um, if it's too perfect, um, the, the Nazis are going to realize it's a ruse if it's... If it's uh, uh, so they have to make sure that they kind of give it uh, something that would make it look like a, a, an officer would have. For example, that they, they go to Lloyd's of London and find a, and find and have them create a letter on their letterhead that he, um, he basically bounced a check. Okay, well, uh, he's he's a little bit scatterbrained. He's an officer. He's at war. Eh, he could, didn't uh, balance his checkbook. They go to the Naval Club in London. And they make sure that, uh, you know, that he, he's got a bill, bill of sale on him that shows that he rented a room for the day. Um, uh, they also make sure, and this is kind of the, uh, the key to, all, to everything here, they go to some high-ranking officers, particularly Lord Louis Mountbatten, who was his, ostensibly his commanding officer, basically vouching for him that William Martin's a good officer. I trust him with it. But the coup de grace in everything in all his pocket litter is a letter that's written from Archibald Nye, who's the vice chief of the Imperial General Staff and would know all their plans, everything that was going on. He's in the home office. To his friend, uh, General Sir Harold Alexander, who's commanding the uh, British forces under Eisenhower uh, in Tunisia and, and, uh, and Syria. This it's, it is a letter that's the key piece basically saying that um, we know that uh, uh, our plans are ultimately going to attack Sardinia. Um, we want you to be prepared for this because we know you're, uh, you're in North Africa, so start your preparations for Sardinia. Mountbatten also puts in a letter um, to, to Martin making a kind of a lame joke about uh, sardines so people could catch on to it. They also try to make sure that it would be, it would come across as a real letter between friends. They make some kind of uh, uh, off-color remarks about uh, working for Eisenhower, what a pain in the butt he is, et cetera, et cetera. But things that, that, that again, that would be plausible. Um, this shows the letter from, from Mountbatten to Admiral Cunningham, who's in charge of the, uh, of the forces uh, in the Mediterranean, the uh, the, the naval forces there, and he makes a joke about, about sardines. They also tried, Chumley and, and Montague try to figure out what, what exactly would William Martin have on him. And they figured it might be something good if it, was, if it was a letter from his dad. And since Montague had kind of taken it under his wing that he was going to create the persona, um, Montague ultimately writes a rather scolding letter. He writes it as if he's the father, uh, basically telling um, Major William Martin to kind of get his act together, that uh, he's got a chance for promotion. This is a big, a big opportunity that the, um, the nation needs you. So instead of kind of a comforting letter from home, this is kind of a scolding letter from dad saying that, you know, the country is counting on you. And of course, what would any naval officer have, but also a picture of his beloved. 
Montague's secretary was a woman named Jean Leslie. And you can see here, um, a rather comely lass. And um, she actually had a bow of her own, but um, uh, she, she produces this picture that she had taken in the summer of 1942. And you can see a woman in a one-piece bathing suit during wartime would be something that she would have uh, sent to her fiance. So Jean Leslie, Pam, uh, as she's known and for purposes, becomes another part of the pocket litter that is found on William Martin. That this is somebody who uh, is a real human being, who's got a real, um, uh, a real beloved at home. And this is somebody who, who cares about him. In fact, they then go to a jeweler and, and have him uh, draft up an engagement ring invoice that he's got on him. All of this stuff will be found on, on William Martin, the corpse's personage, to try to make sure that it is plausible, that he is a real human. They also then make sure that his death notice is put in a London newspaper. And um, because they figure, and they're rightly so, that the uh, the British know that the Germans read the, uh, the British tabloids to see their death notices, and William Martin is a common name, so he's listed there. What becomes a little bit of a, um, a help to MI5, to Chumley and to Montague, is that uh, he's also, the day that this was listed, the British actor Leslie Howard, who you might remember from Gone with the Wind, um, was also killed, but his plane was shot down and his death notice was in the papers that same day. So it, it attracted a lot more attention than it might normally have. In mid-April, uh, all these things have been, have been assembled. We are now into the middle of April and it is determined that they are now ready to launch um, uh, William Martin and have him do his work. Um, Montague goes through the names, the various names of all the operations. The British have a dossier of possible operations. He thinks mincemeat's kind of a cool name. And um, so he, uh, he picks that and it is determined that they are, the, they are going to take the body from London to the Scottish coast. I now introduce a name that uh, hopefully you'll remember because it is a classic British name, St. John, known as Jock Horsefall. He was a race car driver. He was employed by MI5 in, in case they would ever need a driver. Um, Horsefall has a 1937 van that he's customized and he is going to take the, the William Mark, the corpse's body from London to the Scottish coast 420 miles away. Chumley and Montague are gonna ride in the back with the corpse. It's, he's going to drive all night. He's going to get there. And I would be remiss if I forgot, if I left out this detail, Jock Horsfall was legally blind. In the process of driving from, um, from London to, uh, uh, to the Scottish coast. Besides the fact that he almost runs into a tram, besides the fact he runs right over a roundabout, and um, and and that several uh, 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 several pedestrians were almost hit along the way. Somehow he gets there. Were well, there to meet a submarine, the HMS Seraph. It is off the coast of Scotland, and they are going to uh, take a new cargo. The captain, Bill Jewell, is the only one who knows what's going to go on, that the, 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 that the cargo that's being delivered in a special container, uh, which says optical equipment, is actually containing a corpse that has um, uh, been uh, being still cold now with carbon dioxide with dry ice. When the dry ice will melt, the fumes, the, the mist, will actually um, help keep the body preserved. 
before they load it into the container, um, they've um, Montague and, and Chumley have gone down to London. They've taken the body out of uh, the coroner's office. Um, um, Bentley Purchase has turned over the body to him. They run into one little snag. Um, because he's now been on ice for over two months, the feet are frozen. They have to take out um, essentially some sterno, melt the feet so they can put the boots on before, but not make it sure that they burn the feet. But they do it, and they load it, and they load it into uh, uh, into the van. It is going to be taken to a place off the coast of Spain called Huelva, and there's a reason for this. Huelva, besides being a fishing uh, village, um, has a very large Nazi. Um, population. There is uh, uh, some, they know that there are Nazi spies there. Um, Spain is officially neutral, but it was, it's fascist. If you recall that there was a, uh, a revolution in, in the 30s, the, the Spanish Civil War, it's run by Francisco Franco. They are officially, although fascist, they are officially neutral. But also one of the reasons that it, that they target uh, well the Spain is, um, because it's also a Roman Catholic country, they understand that the coroner there does not particularly like to do postmortems and um, uh, and and do and check on cadavers. So they are hopeful that that is going to work in their in their favor. I introduce another man, a guy named Charles Fraser Smith. Um, he was the quartermaster of MI5. He was known as Q, and he will. Um, he had a myriad inventions, um, and he is the one who will actually develop a um, a container uh, that's used to to um, for to keep Martin's body. There it is going to be loaded into the HMS Sarah. They are going to launch it off the coast of Huelva, Spain, as if it was a, a torpedo. Ultimately, um, once it's launched, they do this at 4.30 in the morning. Um, they, they launch the body out. They, they take the body out of it, shoot it out. Um, they, uh, the Seraf then goes 12 miles off the coast of Spain, uh, where they sink uh, the canister. It, in fact, um, Charles Fraser Smith had done such a good job that they riddle it with bullet holes, but it doesn't sink. They actually have to use a plastic explosive to, to make it go away. And, a, and the body of Major William Martin, Royal Navy, is launched off the coast of Welva, Spain. Now, all that pocket litter that I told you about is on his personage, but it's also in what's called a haversack, a, a, um, a billfold of a file that all the that everything that he would have had on him. Now, one of the things that they worried about was that normally speaking, uh, a, a, a person would have had this in his hands. Rigor mortis might have set in, and they were afraid afraid that the haversack would float away. Um, so what they do is they take a, uh, basically a chain, attach it, the haversack to the wrist of the corpse so that it doesn't float away. After all, if you find the body, but you don't find all the, all the ruse, what's the point? So it is attached to Major William Martin's body. It is found by a fisherman about six in the morning. And it is taken to the authorities, the Spanish authorities, um, where they then quickly report it to the German authorities in the town of Huelva. One of the forgotten people in all of this was the vice consul in Huelva, a guy named Francis Hazelden. Hazelden, uh, a career diplomat, was tipped off to what was going on. So he knew this was coming. And he very politely, but formally said to the British and German authorities, but I'm sorry, to the Spanish and, uh, and German authorities, that we understand there was a, a plane crash 
Um, one of our officers um, was shot, or was missing in action. If you happen to find the body, um, there's some papers we would really like to get back. He then sends several telegrams back and forth to London by design, knowing that the Germans and the Spanish were watching him and would intercept it saying, I made contact with, this, with the Spanish government, uh, with the Spanish authorities. I asked for um, William Martin's belongings back. Uh, we'll see what happens. And as it, this goes on for about a week and, it, and he sends several communiques, each one with more urgency, asking the Spanish that if you happen to come across this body, we really, 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 really need these things back. So now the Germans, which had been a little suspicious anyway, are, what have we here? Adding to our story are two gentlemen that uh, uh, go back to your work days. To the right, is a, a spy, a diligent one named Adolf Klaus. He worked for the Abwehr, the German military. He was very by the book. He was thorough. He was, um, he was tenacious. He understood what was going on and he wanted to make sure that if this corpse had something that was of value to the Reich, let's find out about it. But he wanted to do things properly. To the left is a gentleman named Carl Eric Kuhlenthal. Now, again, go back to your work days. Did you ever have a boss that you know that you worked really hard, but the boss was really kind of bucking for a promotion and was going to use your work to try to promote him? Kuhlenthal was that guy. He was desperate to get out of Spain. He wanted a job in Berlin. That's where the action was. That's where the glory was. Klaus, oh, he was a useful tool. He was a good employee. But Kuhlenthal had designs on, on bigger and better things. And he also was fearful that the Third Reich government would realize that he had Jewish blood in him, that his relatives were Jewish. He had hid it. He had kept that, uh, kept that under wraps but he was really hoping for a big score in Spain so he could get a big promotion um, uh, onto Berlin. Well, Klaus is good at his job. Klaus takes a steel rod, a probe, and he, he sticks it in the still wet, they, they've opened up the haversack, they find these envelopes, they find these letters. Klaus takes a, a probe to the still wet, um, envelope, twist it so he's able to, to remove all the documents in there um, and not break the, the wax seal on the envelope. So they, they can read what's inside. The British will know this because the British have actually put an eyelash inside the envelope in case things are taken. And when, they, and when things get back, they realize the eyelash is gone. Well, they go through these things and they see the letter, uh, the letter from Mountbatten, the, but especially the letter from uh, 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 from the uh, from uh, to Alexander, saying that the plan is to go to Sardinia. Kuenthal immediately says, "I must take this to Berlin. I have to take this myself. This is too important." Klaus isn't so sure. This seems a little. Um, a little too perfect, but Kuhlenthal being the boss said, no, 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 Adolf, I got this one. And he takes it directly uh, to the office of Adolf Hitler. While in Berlin, a gentleman there named Baron Alexis von Rena, who's a very trusted advisor to, to Hitler, is there and he looks at the letter too and he authenticates it. Now, what's interesting is that von Rena was very much a German, but very, very much an anti-Hitlerite, a very much an anti-Nazi. It is very possible that Kuhlenthal actually believed it, and von Rona realized that these things were frauds. 
but because he disliked Hitler so much, he was willing to verify it because he felt it would help topple Hitler, that this, that this would be a, that his misleading of Hitler would be to the benefit of, uh, of the Allies. In addition, there was a, um, a double agent, a guy named Juan Pujo was known as Garbo, who uh, was working for Kulenthal. Now, he, uh, Garbo had convinced Kulenthal that he had this network of agents. In fact, he was a double agent, uh, he was Spanish. He was furious at the Germans uh, that they had helped um, install a fascist government. He offered his services to the Nazis who accepted. In point of fact, he, he, he told them he was in Portugal and that the, and he had a network of spies out of Lisbon. In point of fact, he worked for the British. He was in London. He never set foot in Portugal, but the Germans never checked on him and, and they counted on him to... Uh, uh, for his veracity because of his quote-unquote large network of spies. He confirmed that everything about William Martin was true. And in early May, they saw that Hitler ordered that troops were to be removed from Sicily and moved to Sardinia. Pujol sent in Garbo, Agent Garbo, code name, sent a, a message over to London saying, mincemeat swallowed whole. In July 1943, the Allies launch uh, what's known as Operation Husky, the invasion of Sicily, um, and ultimately um, the invasion of Italy. Sicily goes far easier than expected. Now, it's not entirely all mincemeat's doing, but it had a large part to that. Um, uh, ultimately, Mussolini, who always felt that the Allies were going to come to Sicily, uh, becomes overthrown in the summer of 1943. Hitler, who always felt they were going to Sardinia or Greece, but in this case, Sardinia, um, uh, was absolutely shaken when they go to Sicily and, uh, and ultimately capture Italy. Really upset them. Um, if you've heard the talks that we've done about the, all the deceptions that go on to the D-Day thing in Normandy uh, with the Enigma codes and et cetera and all, all the, the ruses of Operation Bodyguard, in some regards, it is because of the success of mincemeat that Hitler doesn't believe all of the uh, uh, everything that's going on with the Normandy invasion until it's too late, he where he doesn't free up um, uh, panzer divisions until July 1944 when it's too late. Now, um, the, the roaring success of, uh, uh, of mincemeat is not overlooked. Um, in 1944, Montague was made a knight. Uh, 1948, Chumley is made a knight. Um, uh, they bask in the success. But in 1950, a former cabinet officer named Duff Cooper writes a book um, in which he, uh, it's a fiction book supposedly, but he talks about how a dead body uh, was used to, um, to fake out the Germans with some deception plans. And um, MI5 gets wind of this and they tell Montague, we got to head this off. So they authorize Montague to write a book called The Man Who Never Was. It's a sanitized version um, uh, that, uh, um, and if you read his book, it's a, it's a good read, but things don't go quite as well as, as Montague would have you believe. Um, there's a book that's out by a gentleman named Ben McIntyre um, uh, uh, called Operation Mincemeat, that if you really want to learn more about that, I would recommend the McIntyre book. Um, in 1956, a movie that you might still see, it's, it's been out uh, on Turner Classic Movies called The Man Who Never Was, starring Clifton Webb, Gloria Graham, you might remember her from um, It's a Wonderful Life. And also, uh, you'll, you'll see a part in there, if you watch it, the, the actor Stephen Boyd, is a German spy. Now, if you watch the movie, the Stephen Boyd part, he, that, that's Masala from Ben-Hur, if you don't recognize the name. Um, the part with the German spy doesn't really occur, that's Hollywood. 
but the but MI5 records show that German spies plural actually did check up on the where the, on the whereabouts and the bona fides of William Martin. So all of their pocket uh, uh, material in all his deceptions came to pass because they actually did go to the Royal Navy Club to make sure of a guy named William Martin was there. They actually did go to Lloyd's of London in multiple spies. So people did check out the German spies that it happened. But Stephen Boyd becomes one composite character. Ian Fleming remembered. Um, later, he, uh, he writes a book called You Only Live Twice, which was based upon Operation Mincemeat, the, the creator of, uh, uh, of James Bond. So he remembers. But it wasn't until the 1990s because a, a burial marker actually had been placed in Welva, Spain in 1943 for Major William Martin. In 1996, um, at the request of uh, a DNA sample, um, the body was dug up and it was revealed to be the body of a, of a, of a Welshman named Glenwer Michael. Glenwer Michael, um, really existed. He was a homeless man, age 34. Um, he had inadvertently died by asphyxiation because of uh, being homeless, his eyesight was failing. Um, he had inadvertently put rat poisoning on a British biscuit. He thought it was jam. He had licked it and he passed away due to asphy asphyxiation. But one of the reasons his body was chosen was because he was homeless, he did not have any next of kin. So there was no other person there to claim his body. Now remember, as we said before, finding a body at this time wasn't all that easy. But you also wanted to make sure if you did find a body that the next of kin wasn't gonna claim it. So because he didn't have next of kin, um, uh, it, it passed. Um, the, the grave marker was redone so it says what William Martin and also Glenwer Michael. So both names are now on the body. It is still um, in Welva, Spain. Um, so if you feel the need to travel there, you can actually see the body of William Martin. Um, but we now know the real identity. Again, I mentioned if you want to buy a book, uh, Eight Cousins will have these. Um, I would recommend Ben McIntyre's Operation Mincemeat. It's um, it, 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 a, a thorough examination of, of what happened. Um, and Montague's book is a good read too, uh, especially if we're still all at home being quarantined. It's worth the price. Now, before we leave, I had mentioned about um, a guy named Ian Fleming and all roads in. Now, uh, there really was a Q that he took. There really was a, an M who was in charge of MI5. So I have a couple questions to leave you about Ian Fleming. This is the creator of, um, of James Bond, as I mentioned. What was the biggest selling book ever written by Ian Fleming? And what did Fleming call his home in Jamaica? These so are great, great for parties when we get unquarantined. The answers are, he's the author of Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, and at his Jamaican mansion called Golden Eye, that's where he wrote his, his books about James Bond. Now, I'd also mention, too, one other little trivia fact. Um, I mentioned that uh, William, uh, William Martin's uh, death notice was in the paper the same day as Leslie Howard. And again, if you remember Leslie Howard, he's, he's Ashley from um, Gone with the Wind, another tall, dignified guy. He died in a plane crash too. And you may not know why. Well, Winston Churchill was visiting um, in the United States for the first time. Uh, he was visiting with, um, with Franklin Roosevelt. He knew that in order to get back and fly back from uh, from Washington to, uh, to London, uh, he knew he was being watched by, uh, uh, by, by, uh, by German spies. 
So at five minutes to five, there was a flight, a, a British, a BOAC flight leaving to go to London. And a rather short man, dumpy guy, looking like, like Winston Churchill boards. And the, uh, the Germans immediately notify Berlin. And they see him with a bodyguard, tall man. The BOAC plane, one hour into his flight, was shot down by... Um, by the Luftwaffe, the plane crashed. It turns out that Leslie Howard was the body double of, of Winston Churchill's bodyguard. So he died in a plane crash in a ruse that was created by MI5. Winston Churchill had actually flown out earlier that night and got home safely. So with that, I thank you very much. Um, I hope you enjoyed this. I hope it did not put you to sleep. Um, um, and uh, I want to thank you for your for your attention. I hope um, you you join us for more of our virtual talks. Um, uh, any questions here? Did I answer all your questions? Did, what, what, was it worth your time? All right. Well, thank you very much. Our next talk will be a week from tonight as a gentleman named Ronald Rossbottom at seven o'clock on, on May 28th. Uh, we also have one on June 2nd. And if you go to our website, you will see all our virtual talks. Again, they are free. Um, yeah, Marianne, you got a question. No, just thank you. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you, everybody, and have a good night. Stay safe. I'll, I'll, I'll see you soon. <laughs>